Hello and welcome to our webinar series, Caring in Crisis, The Leader Briefs. I'm your host today, Reverend Mary Gudrow Hughes with Crisis Care Ministries, and we're so pleased to be here with you today. I'm pleased to be able to offer support to Church World Service over this six week series. We're really glad you're here today because we know that faith and community leaders are facing extraordinary and historic events that are significantly challenging our creativity, our resilience, our capacity to respond. And so in this series over the next six weeks, we'll be hearing from some amazing leaders and specialists in crisis response and recovery, mental health, congregational and family life, as they offer their experiences and knowledge and hope to help us as we face some of the difficult crises impacting our communities. Today, we're very blessed to have the opportunity to hear from Reverend Pamela Holt as she visits with us about running on fumes, faith leaders, and the cumulative cost of compassion. But before I introduce her, I have a couple of housekeeping details for you. Uh, first of all, as happens often with technology, today we've had some Mac, Apple incompatibilities and we're not going to be able to see Pam's face for her presentation. We'll just hear her voice. The good news is that you can go to crisiscareministries.net click on the webinar hub as you see here on your screen go to the presenter bios and get a sense of who pam is and see her photo there the bad news is that you won't get to see the pam pamela holt that i know and the amazing compassion as she is presenting and talking about each of us but we'll get to hear her voice and so we're grateful for that part of our technology a few housekeeping details before I formally introduce Pamela Holt. As the introduct introductory slide rotation indicates, you can find all things webinar, details about the schedule, the presenters, and resources our presenters have provided at crisiscareministries.net. Just click on the webinar hub at the top of the page. Throughout the webinar today, please feel free to type questions or comments in the question box. That's the question box, not the chat box. We'll be monitoring the question box. And we hope to address your questions and comments toward the end of the hour. After the webinar, watch your inboxes for links to the webinar recordings and a link to the session evaluation. And if you requested an attendance certificate when you registered for the series, you'll be receiving that by email as well. Now it is my honor to introduce to you today's presenter, the Reverend Pamela Holt. Pamela Holt joyfully serves the Oklahoma Christian Church Disciples of Christ as the regional minister. As she has traveled the region over the past seven years, she's moved by the diversity and depth of ministries she has witnessed. Reverend Holt is passionate about creating community, deepening discipleship, and attending to seasons of grief that come with loss. In the long season of the pandemic, she has encouraged and cared for clergy who, in the reframing of meaningful worship and ministry, have discovered a deep level of exhaustion. Reverend Holt graduated from Texas Christian University in 1990 and Bright Divinity School in 1993. She, serves three, she served three very different congregations in Texas prior to being called to serve as the regional minister in Oklahoma in January of 2015. I know you join me in welcoming the Reverend Pamela Holt. Well, a glorious good morning to all of you. And I wanna thank you, Mary, for your beautiful introduction uh, and your invitation for me to participate in this Caring in Crisis Church World Service webinar series. I am so pleased to be with you all. And despite our uh, technical difficulties this morning, while I like to do this kind of thing in small group, 
um, so that I can get feedback from the people who are listening. I can't see you either, so you can't see me. We're going to pretend this is a podcast or an old-timey radio show. As we begin this morning, I think it's important that we take a moment to do a meditation, which I really, really love. It's called the 54321 meditation, and you may be familiar with it. Um, this uh, meditation helps us to bring us right into the present. Um, so if you are in a comfortable chair, maybe you have some coffee, maybe you have a piece of paper and a pen beside you, or maybe you're sitting at your desk, I want you to find a place just to make yourself um, comfortable. I want you to practice, um, I know you're breathing. I want you to practice breathing a little differently. I'd like for you to breathe deeply, extending your diaphragm or your belly with an inhale and then exhale. And I want you to continue a slow rhythm of breathing um, doesn't always have to be that deep, but a slow rhythm of breathing while I guide you through some of our senses in addition to breathing. I'd like for you to first, while you're breathing, to observe your physical surroundings. Now, I imagine everybody is in a different physical surrounding. In the room or the place that you are in, and I'd like for you to find five five things or items that you can see. Five things you can see. You can whisper them to yourself. You can write them on a piece of paper. Just simply notice five things you can see. We give thanks for our eyes this morning. I'd like you to close your eyes and take a moment to really feel your body. I'd like for you to feel four things. What four things can you feel? It could be your toes wiggling in your shoes. It could be the clothing on your skin. What can you feel? Four things. Breathe and feel. We give thanks, O oh Holy One, for our sense of touch. With your eyes still closed, I'd like for you to listen closely to your surroundings. I'd like for you to listen carefully and perhaps name three sounds that you can hear. I hear a train in the distance and my stomach growling. Thank you, O oh God, for our sense of listening. Now I'd like to take a moment and bring awareness to your sense of smell. I'd like for you to notice two scents that might be in your space. Name or list two things you can smell. Even though it might be difficult, we give thanks for our sense of smell. And lastly, I'd like for you to name one thing that you can taste this morning. Again, your eyes might be closed and you might be breathing. Try to notice something you can taste. We 
we give thanks that we can taste and see and hear and feel and smell that this life is good. I'd like to read a poem, which could also be a prayer for you. It's by Sarah Rossiter. It goes like this. It could have landed anywhere, swamp or forest. Instead, floating on the quiet air, the tiny feather down drifted, weightless from the open sky into my cupped and waiting hands. Cream colored, fragile, soft as a milkweed, a wordless message from beyond reminding me how like the feather we're all carried on the breath of the creator, the Holy One. Amen. You can open your eyes, but I surely would like for you to keep breathing. <laughs> I wanna follow up with a few things Mary said about my introduction. First and foremost, I am a minister. I have served um, as a regional minister for the last seven years, and I am currently, um, well, I served prior to that as a local minister in a local pastorate, in a local congregation in three different communities. Uh, my gifts always centered around people whose hearts were broken by some kind of loss, either suddenly or tragically, or from an illness, or a job change, or some kind of transition in their life. One congregation I served over a short period of a few years, there were seven deaths of men in their 50s, leaving seven widows who, as you might imagine, were utterly lost in grief. They could not figure out their new identity or their function in their lives, either with their family or with their community, their faith community. There were also two deaths of young people. One was 13 and one was 18. This intense experience with grief catapulted me to work on a doctorate of ministry degree in pastoral care and I was seeking, um, as we all might be these days, additional tools, maybe even some magic or miracle to help people overcome their deep grief. I really was looking for some kind of wand. To my disappointment, there is no magic or miracle. However, I was able to create a group with these widows and some creative work with them to help them rewrite a story of sadness and beauty to help them rediscover and renew their own identity. And I will say, 15 years later, these women are all still meeting together. They have developed their own ministry of helping others through the grief process of losing a spouse. Secondly, particularly in the last two years, which really is where, um, this kind of webinar today is landing in this unprecedented, extraordinary season of a pandemic that we've all lived through in um, remarkable and sad ways. I'm very aware of the overwhelming grief that comes from a multiplicity or a variety of losses. Not just the thousands of beloved people who have died from COVID in my own state of Oklahoma, but also the 900,000 plus beloved people in our nation who have died and even more in our world. It's just overwhelming when we think about that and can stop us in our tracks. I'm very aware of the rippling effects of grief with family and friends and coworkers for just one person who dies from caregivers to funeral arrangements to services of celebration and remembrance. But when we think of the thousands, sometimes it can be paralyzing. Grief is also present with 
other areas of our lives that we've had to put on pause. For instance, the mobility that brought many of us to stay at home uh, in the last couple of years or not being able to see family or friends and gather for what we used to call going out to eat or sharing um, time in our own dining room, not being able to travel for a long vacation or sometimes even just to go to work to gather with colleagues or to gather for worship or to rearrange the ways we manage our personal business. And we also have to include this, the breaking open of systems that continue to reveal the injustices that we probably knew existed, but now we are forced to confront. You can certainly add to this list as you like. As a judicatory leader, I have the privilege and the honor and the joy sometimes mostly a lot of joy of overseeing and walking alongside over 200 clergy. In addition, I'm also the chair of our denomination's general commission on clergy that provides credentialing for all disciples of Christ clergy in our faith tradition and holds standing for a little over 200 clergy who serve in our general ministries as missionaries around the world as chaplains in the military and federal institutions such as prisons and hospitals. And just with that small population, I watch and I see and I listen to what many faith leaders and community leaders are experiencing in what I call a very difficult and challenging season of ministry. I also carry my own grief around many of these um, situations or issues. But in addition to those, our region has had deaths of four clergy in the past three months, active clergy from surgery or from a heart attack in his church office before worship on a Sunday morning, or last week from a long journey with cancer. And right when I walked in the door from that service on Sunday, I got another phone call about a woman, a clergy person who died from complications from COVID. So it's just like you can't catch a breath before something else is in front of you that needs your attention, your care, your love. I know that's true, but we're going to invite you uh, Mary, if you want to uh, advance to the next slide, we're going to take a poll of you all. We'll see if this works. Um, it's four questions that we'll be asking you, and you'll respond um, on the screen. And we'll kind of get an, we'll show you what the numbers are and how many, how many of us have had contact with overwhelming issues, grief, um, hardships. So in your role as a community leader and or faith leader, approximately how many individual contacts do you have with people in your communities? You can select one of those uh, followings. There's five opportunities for you to answer and you're just estimate. Mary, do we need to move to the second question? Is that the answer to the first one? Yes, yes. That was, um, I, I hope that was a typical week is what we meant to ask. Um, so as you can see, many of you are around uh, between 50 um, and 150. Some of you have quite a few more. Um, so you are interacting with people um, all the time in all different stages 
of grief and situations. Let's do our second question. In your role as a faith leader and or community leader, approximately how many hours per month do you provide any level of care of support? This would include sermons and teaching for individuals who are grieving a significant loss in the past 18 to 24 months. Now this, is, this could be a lot. Um, how many, approximately, just estimate, do you provide any level of care, including sermons and or teaching? Maybe these numbers aren't high enough for you. Our third, oh, this is the response, yes. Okay, a good fair amount between 20 and um, more than 80. Um, let's go to the next question. On a scale between one and five, five being the most grief you have seen or can imagine in a congregation, agency, or organize, organization is experiencing, what is the current level of grief in your congregation, synagogue, temple, agency, or organization? Again, just estimate based upon your observation. The current level of grief. A three or four, that's significantly high, yes. Some of you all have a five, some of you have a one. All right, and our last question, thank you, is, this is a true or false question. I am personally grieving more than I was even a year ago. True, mostly true, some false. Thank you for participating in this um, polling. Kind of gives us a, a glimpse of where you all are on this journey. If we could advance to the next slide. This is a picture that I have borrowed from um, Charlie Maxey. Um, he wrote a wonderful book called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. And this is one of a picture out of that. And it says, um, have you met others who have struggled? It's the boy asking the question, sitting in front of the wise horse. And the horse says, I've never met anyone who hasn't. So um, even an author can encapsulate the amount of grief that um, people are wrestling with. Um, this book is not all that old. Um, so I invite you to sit with that for just a few moments um, and then we'll advance to the next slide, Mary. Thank you. This slide um, that you're about to see is um, the umbrella with the raindrops on top was from an image that I did with another ministerial partner and uh, Mary um, almost uh, 18 months ago when we were first dealing with COVID and the po political election and pretty intense racism. 
And I borrowed this picture and um, really began to identify other things that have been happening in the last 18 months in addition to those three raindrops that are pouring on top of our umbrella that tries to keep us safe unless it gets old, unless it gets torn, unless the wind blows it in the opposite direction. So we have, of course, the ongoing pandemic. It is not over yet. We have uh, vaccinations with question marks because that seems to have um, caused a lot of grief, whether to um, get a vaccination or not get a vaccination and correct information around it. Masks with a question mark, should we be wearing them? Should we not be wearing them? And causes all kinds of um, controversy around masks with a lot of grief involved, school issues, our children, oh my goodness, our children, should they go to school? Are they in school? Are they home taught? Are they online? Does everybody have access? What about the parents that have to stay home from work? Um, it's just, um, what about when they're diagnosed with um, or have been exposed to COVID and then they have to stay home? It just has created all kinds of upheaval in people's lives. We know about the great resignation with people resigning from their positions, their jobs, which is even affecting the life of the church, nonprofit organizations. Um, we, in our own faith tradition, um, we have 60 some odd positions open in the United States and Canada, and we have very few candidates who are interested in changing locations or are feeling called to a new location. So even in the life of the church and ministry, there feels like this great resignation is impacting it. We have climate control that seems to be screaming at us. We have a healthcare crisis with doctors and nurses and shortages. And if you have a family member that serves in the healthcare crisis, um, you've heard their stories firsthand overwhelming numbers of deaths in the world, which I've mentioned. We've had delayed celebrations of life or funeral services for loved ones. And now we have Russia's war on Ukraine and all the implications with another war. And that is, is, isn't even to mention the ongoing justice issues that have come before us, like racism and capital punishment and transgender issues, even this week in Texas, and books that parents are asking to come off library shelves. I mean, you can add your own justice issues to the list, and I invite you to do so. Um, one of our senior ministers at um, one of our larger congregations named uh, David Spain said recently in a sermon, there is so much to lament in our lives. The ongoing pandemic, the associated frustrations that continues with that, the stubborn inequities that exist not only racially, but economically, the increasing divisions of people into seemingly irreconcilable camps, the abhorrent historic behavior by those in power, including those in the church who have been, been complicit in caring more about protecting the institution they serve than serving the people for whom the institutions exist, the Orwellian use of language proclaiming lies as facts and facts as suspect, the challenges of living on this earth so generously given by God and so callously disregarded by those to whom it has been entrusted. There's just so many things, so many things. I say all that not to paint this, you know, very cloudy, dark, stormy picture, but I say all this because I've said it earlier, we've got to take a breath somewhere and all encapsulated in all these pieces where we can't find a way to catch our breath. I believe grief is one of the biggest challenges that 
really is the overarching piece. I call it the shroud of grief. And it is individual and it is collective. Everyone, everyone is covered in a shroud of grief, which clouds the heart and the mind and makes us all long for what once was. And alongside that, anger is a part of grief. It's a big challenge. Anger that the pandemic is still among us and anger that when a loved one is in need of healthcare, the hospitals are full and cannot tend to our loved one. Anger that has washed ashore to many of our healthcare workers and has overwhelmed and exhausted them. Shock and anguish when congregational members um, whom they've sat with for maybe 50 years on the same pew, their conversations become heated discussions with harsh words and painful decisions and unimaginable conflict um, over simple safety protocols um, or who exclaim that a very well-prepared, faithful Sunday morning message or Bible study or um, whatever ever kind of study you do in your community is all of a sudden political. It's exhausting, just absolutely, utterly exhausting. Um, and another, another um, form of grief, you can go ahead and change that. Yes, sorry, I forgot about the slides. Um, another form of exhaustion is that clergy who have led worship, um, who have had to transition in just a very short period of time to be an in-person sanctuary, temple, um, uh, mosque, uh, synagogue, have they've all had to turn into an online kind of tele-evangelist mode. While numbers are high, they meet online, numbers recede, they go back to in-person, there's a surge, they go back to online. It's um, to do all of the tech and to manage all of the creativity that it takes to make it uh, effective and meaningful worship and to prepare a meaningful, creative, um, some kind of words that promote uh, joy and hope. Uh, our pastors, you're already laying on the floor. I can see you. So my question is, are you running on fumes? I I'm afraid if you were honest, you would say yes. And you can't pull into the next gas station and purchase fuel. There isn't a gas station that can provide this kind of fuel that you need. So as I thought about this hour, um, I wondered, um, who am I actually talking to today? A am I talking to you as people who are attending to your own grief? Or am I providing you with resources to help those whom you serve? Um, I think the answer could be both. I would like to imagine that I'm mostly going to help you a bit and provide some pastoral care for you. Um, not as a counselor, not as um, an expert, but as a person who really has um, her feet on the ground, her boots on the ground. I, I do wear boots every day, um, Western boots, um, who uh, who sees the, you know, the grimace and the wrinkled brow and the exhaustion in the eyes and maybe even um, the lack of creativity. We could do a whole nother webinar on how this kind of exhaustion and this kind of stress affects your brain and it affects your body. Um, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to talk about dealing with cumulative grief and collective 
grief. So Mary, if you want to advance the slide. So what we have, uh, particularly over the last two years, is an accumulation of unprocessed grief that has been happening day after day, week after week, month after month, um, year after year. And as again, you just barely can coll collect yourself and take a breath before you're all of a sudden dealing with some uh, something else that is tragic or hurtful or sorrow filled. So you have a cumulative on top of, on top of, on top of, and as um, maybe clergy or faith leaders or leaders in the community, you're also grieving um, kind of for those that you care for because you're watching them grieve too. And as good caregivers, we like to take their grief sometimes and hold on to it, which means we're double grieving. Well, if we're caring for a community, we may be triple or quadruple grieving as we accidentally or maybe on purpose hold on to that grief and give it to the Holy One to care for. We also have collective grief, which means we have communities that are collectively in grief together. Um, I'll say more about that in a minute. But it has to do with, you see, we've had a lot of protests among our nation. And so people are collectively gathering to make their grief, their suffering of injustice known and coming together despite a pandemic. Um, and it's even worth getting exposed to COVID to fight for their brothers and sisters, their siblings that have no voice. Um, it also is um, our polarized um, communities have also realized a collective grief among us. So you wanna go to the next slide, Mary? I'm kind of paying attention to the time as well. Um, so how do we deal with this collective grief and how do we deal with um, this cumulative grief? We can, um, of course, um, ignore it. We can, um, of course, deny it. Uh, we can compartmentalize it. We can put it in a box and put a nice pretty bow on it and put it on the shelf. Um, but I promise you it will re-emerge. It, it could come back out as typical grief. Grief never really leaves us. It could come out as a complicated grief. Um, which comes out as uh, maybe a some kind of disorder. Um, in other words, it it creates a disorder in our minds or our hearts, where we um, it, maybe we can't find our keys and we spend 30 minutes looking for our keys when we know we put them on the counter, and lo and behold. Um, 30 minutes later, they're right there on the counter. How did that happen? Uh, it's a disordering of your mind. Um, or you forgot to pick up something that was on your grocery list. Or you, there's all kinds of lists that you could make that you could share. We could popcorn it out if we could be together in community that you could list. And we could laugh at and say, oh, it's just old age. But it really becomes complicated grief in some ways. It could come out as trauma, could come out as anxiety, could come out as depression. Um, so advance to the next slide. And here are another series of things you can think about if it's identifiable. Um, could it be depression? Could it be an in inability to feel some kind of uh, joy in your life? Could it uh, feel like you're stuck. Um, the words on the page, there's no words coming out of your mind for something you're preparing for and you can just keep staring at a blank piece of page. And I've heard clergy say to me, I, I just don't have any words. I, I don't have any words. Um, you might even feel worthless at some point because you don't have enough words. 
Mary, I want to skip the next slide. I want to offer to you um, a couple of ways I want to transition to how do we process it, whether individual, collective, or cumulative. Um, one of my colleagues reminded me recently that one of the ways we usually deal with our grief and find healing for our grief and our collective grief and our cumulative grief um, is to tell the story over and over. Um, that used to be the way we handled grief. You know, if somebody died, you went and shared with your best friend or maybe a colleague. Um, however, this has become difficult in some ways because our friends are also dealing with overwhelming grief and they don't have the wherewithal or the energy in them to hold you up when you need to be held up. Um, it's harder and harder to find those blessed, lovable people. Um, we're not in the same patterns of travel every day. Um, you know, you used to travel to the grocery store, travel to get your hair cut, or travel to work. Um, and so you saw uh, different kinds of people in our in your lives. And whether you were, you know, your hairdresser, your hairstylist was a person that you shared a lot of things going on in your life, and they might have known things that other people wouldn't know about you. And you don't go to the hairdresser as often as you used to, or the way we go to the doctor and share what's wrong with our bodies is so different. Um, so everything is different. Um, and so we have to find new ways to uh, find friendships, um, trust, and people that can hold us for a bit. Um, also, we've not been able to um, ritualize our grief like we used to. Maybe we can more in the most recent days, but we've not been able over the past two years to gather in a community and celebrate and remember a loved one or a friend. And no one really has been able to gather with us except maybe on Zoom um, to hear the reflective stories of the beloved's life or to see flowers as an expression of love or to laugh together or to cry together, um, to find closure. Um, and so uh, while my colleagues continue to remind me how important it is to make a list of all those things that they're grieving because they're gonna come back and they're gonna take those things one by one and begin to provide some new and special kind of ritual around their loss. So um, in this harboring of grief, and particularly in this season, you may find difficult sleeping, hard to focus, limited attention span, mood swings, argumentative confusion, isolation, feelings of hopelessness, overeating, undereating, over-the-counter drugs, alcohol, um, you know, all those are real expressions of this deep collective running out of fuel. If you're not in a healthy place, then you're going to try to cover that with something to feel good. Um, so uh, what do we do? What do we do? First, we have to pick it up and we have to put a name on it. Maybe you have some cards. You put it on the card and you put it on the table and you name it and you become friends with it. Barbara Brown Taylor, uh, not Barbara Brown Taylor, Barbara, uh, I'm sorry, Brene Brown, in her new research, you might roll your eyes at me mentioning Brene Brown. Um, I don't think of her as a theologian, but an exceptional researcher for the human emotions. In her newest research gives us some helpful ways to think about grief. She has spent years researching emotions, and in Atlas of the Heart, she identifies in real common everyday language, 87 of the emotions, not all of them, but 87 of them, and experiences that define what it means to be human. And while this is not really meant to be a clinical resource book, it surely is intended to give us names for feelings 
and to be able to learn the language to better connect with ourselves and with others. In two of her chapters, places we tend to go when we're hurting is anguish, hopelessness, despair, sadness, and grief. And the places we tend to go with others is compassion, pity, empathy, sympathy, boundaries, and comparative suffering. Those are the, all the two things, all the things that we've been talking about today. And she gives you these lovely, very common, able to hold on to definitions. The second helpful way to attend to this overwhelming grief and running out of energy is a book that I discovered through Faith Trust Institute, which is on the slide before you called Trauma Stewardship by Laura Vandernoot Lipsky, written with Connie Burke. In this book, um, this is just quite a gem at this time in this place, in addition to Brene Brown's language for emotions. Um, she begins this with a story about her being on vacation. And um, she and her family have hiked to the top of some cliffs on a small island. And for a moment, the entire family was standing quietly together, marveling and looking out at the sea. It was an exquisite sight. There was turquoise water as far as you could see, a vast cloudless sky, an air that was incredible to breathe. And as the family reached the top of the cliffs, Laura's first thought was, this is unbelievably, unbelievably beautiful. And then immediately her second thought was, I wonder how many people have killed themselves by jumping off these cliffs. Assuming that everyone around her in her family would have exactly the same thought, she asked her question out loud and then her stepfather-in-law turned to her slowly and asked, are you sure all your trauma work hasn't gotten to you? That made her think for a moment. Her work had gotten to her. She didn't even tell him the rest of what she was thinking. Where will the helicopter land? What's the closest level one trauma center? Can they transport them to a hospital? How long will it take? It was a moment that she truly comprehended the degree to which her work had transformed the way she had engaged the world. So it's quite a gem and it's written for people on the front line, so to speak, like us, um, like us. Uh, anybody who interacts with the suffering and the pain and the crisis of others or our planet. Her work actually takes a reader on a journey with story, with a cartoon that's kind of funny here and there, and some very important questions to begin to understand the ways in which we can get overwhelmed as caregivers and find ourselves in trauma and how to find our way out of that. So the next slide is the slide of the 16 different traumas that she mentions. And while hers was just thinking on top of a beautiful mountain, sometimes that comes out with when you're in a gathering somewhere and somebody says to you, all you talk about these days is your work. Do you still have a family or do, do you still do fun things? And it's all of a sudden that you realize, oh dear, I have been consumed. I have been consumed. It means you're way down there on the energy or the fuel level, closer towards empty more than full. So these are the 16 signs that Laura warns us of, of the, and that highlighted word is exposure, um, an exposure response. These are the things she's identified. When you put them up against uh, Brene Brown's words, they're really kind of a beautiful thing. It's a new way to look at how we are um, dealing with our stress, our hurt, our pain, our suffering, our emptiness. And then she gives you questions at the end of each chapter um, to realize 
how important healthy boundaries are for us as caregivers. Um, you can go to the next slide. I always want to mention, um, just because this is who we are, if you ever get to a place that you are um, considering or thinking about suicide, we certainly want you to reach out. Um, if you have a client or a parishioner or a friend or a family member, are there thoughts of suicide? We certainly want to give you this National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, there are all kinds of resources for you and we want to help you and we want to love you and we want to care for you. Thank you, you can advance to the next slide. Before I welcome or invite some um, comments in the chat, which we'll just have about five minutes for, the Faith Trust Institute is an institute that does um, pretty significant work uh, in healthy boundaries for clergy, could be first responders as well. Um, it, it's really important that we use healthy boundaries and they really um, give us the why we should develop healthy boundaries, um, primarily so that we can continue to be shepherds and spiritual caregivers for those entrusted to our care. They too have developed a list of questions to self-identify what they call compassion fatigue, could be stewardship trauma. Um, I stress to all those in my care how important it is to take care of yourself, especially these days. And I don't just mean one day off during the week where you have one eye on the TV in your lounge chair and one eye on your laptop email or your phone email or your, um, you know, your uh, cell phone. This is a much deeper, deeper dive into knowing what I call heart language, into knowing the stories you yourself are telling and becoming aware of the triggers, into intentionally understanding healthy boundaries for yourself and then practicing them because it's then that we begin to fall in love with our call again, those gifts that God calls us to use and long to share this love and this grace with the people in our care and loving them, loving them so much so that we bring them alongside and we help them to find their way to healing and wholeness and creativity and even dreaming of serving others, which is what it's all about. We are servants to others. One quick example of this example of healthy boundaries and learning to understand this heart language and these identifiers for this really precious, sensitive time. Um, you can't do it by yourself. You can start by yourself, but it really helps to have a coach or a friend or a colleague, someone you can trust to be an accountable partner with you. Um, and uh, I was going on sabbatical last summer. I was gonna take three months off. And I thought on a sabbatical, you had to have a list of things that you wanted to accomplish and do. And my coach said, that's a lovely list of things to do. I want you to take that list and throw it away and I want you to learn how to be, to do nothing and how to be. My anxiety went from very low to off the chart because what was I going to do for three months if I didn't have a list of things to do, right? And she said, you're gonna learn how to be and you're gonna, you're gonna deal with some of these issues, this grief process, one by one, I promise. And lo and behold, I was taking healthy boundaries right at the same time. And I was learning that I had not set enough boundaries for myself. And so I went back and redesigned my healthy boundaries and I did not come back to work if somebody special died or 
if some water pipe broke or if the secretary couldn't help uh, a person. There were, there were absolutely no reasons why I would come back to work. I put all those pieces in place and I had a wonderful, beautiful, exhilarating, safe three month sabbatical. Now your institution, organization, church may not afford you a three month sabbatical, but maybe you could take one week, two weeks, a month to discover what's going on in your heart and in your mind. You matter and we care about you. And God, God, our creator, the Holy One cares about you as well, deeply. So do we have any questions? We do have questions. Um, we have a number of pragmatic questions related to getting uh, access to the information that you've shared. Um, several people have asked about getting a copy of the PowerPoint. I would remind you that resources that the presenters are, are sharing can be found at crisiscareministries.net, webinar hub, click on resources and you'll see Pam, uh, Dr., uh, I'm sorry, Reverend Holt has already um, put on the resources a uh, selected bibliography. So th those questions are, are frequently asked here as well. Um, we have several comments related to um, uh, an amazing book. I think that they were probably talking about your uh, one of the books that you spent quite a bit of time on there. Um, we have a question here about, is it typical for symptoms of grief and depression to overlap? And yes. the statement says, I go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead and finish it. Um, I read the symptoms on that slide, and for me, each symptom from each column has been an experience of overwhelming blending together. Is this serious or is it typical along with mental health, uh, along the mental health journey? That's a great, great question. Um, grief appears in so many different ways and facets, and just when you think you might uh, have overcome grief, here comes another wave in a different form. And so, um, you know, I would certainly um, encourage uh, encourage all of us when we have those overlapping feelings of grief or even one identifier that's been named. You can have all 16 or you can have one um, to, uh, you know, f uh, engage um, a, a counselor or engage maybe a pastor at the next level um, where you're serving uh, for some really important and significant resources that can pay particular attention to the grief process. Um, it's not a one thing, one answer fits all. It's kind of a multiple variety of things. And the first thing that we kind of have to do is peel back the onion and figure out what, what the feeling is. So that's a, that's a journey in and of itself. And there are resources and, um, you know, the first step is to, to look at your own structure and see, is there a judicatory leader above you or that has resources that you can resource? Uh, is there a hospital that has those, uh, that offers those kind of pastoral resources? Chaplains are, chaplains in and of themselves need those resources as well these days. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I would love, to continue this course on and do small groups and do um, exercises and uh, you know reflection uh, for about six weeks on in a journey of grief and how we come out of this maybe in a new and different way. That's my next task, Mary. Well, um, Pamela, I, I, uh, Dr. Sorry, uh, Reverend Holt, we're so glad that you've been here. We um, try to keep these webinars right at an hour, and we are at the end of our time. So many good questions left unanswered in our questions 
as well. Um, I would just invite you to, um, let me put up the slide here that gives the contact Mary, is it possible to take some of those questions and maybe write out some answers and put them on their resource pages for them to have access to? That's a great idea. That's an excellent idea. I'm going to um, talk with Heather, who is our tech specialist at Church World Service, to see if we can make sure that we preserve the questions that are here as well. Um, that's a really good suggestion. Here is Reverend Holt's email address if you want to ask her directly what, uh, what questions that you have as well. And I think that that is an excellent suggestion. There were several that requested more resources, many suggestions and comments here about uh, going to spiritual direction and going to therapy. And so um, a lot of good resources, even here in the wisdom of this particular group. So I know you join me in saying thank you to Reverend Holt for her inspiring presentation. Thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you next week, same time as we welcome the Reverend Dr. Kevin Ellers as he presents to us the first 48 hours spiritual caregivers as first responders. Kevin uh, Ellers is uh, an amazing friend of mine who does amazing training all throughout the, the nation really and internationally in responding after crises. Remember to go to the webinar hub and to watch your emails for further information as well as your uh, attendance certificates. In the chat, you'll see as well, perhaps, that Heather Wilson says, if you did not, if you did not happen to um, check that you want an attendance certificate when you registered, that you can contact her at crisis, let me see her email address, uh, H Wilson, H-W-I-L-L-S-O-N, at cwsglobal.org. Thank you all again for being here. Be safe and blessings to you all.